Hey there, it's Phil. Welcome back to the show. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. Hi, Sky. Welcome back from South Korea. Thank you. And Calgary? Calgary. Calgary. Yeah. Christian Taylor is not with us. She has work. Good for her. She, do you know what she's doing? Getting paid, which I'm not. She's getting paid, which you're not. That's true, but the, it's more than that. Hmm. It's so much more. She is managing 200 extras for, was it a movie shoot or a TV shoot? A movie for a movie shoot in Chicago. Really? She's managing, she's being a mother hen for 200 extras. Are, and do we think they're all dressed like zombies right now? Or What's the movie? Uh, teeny boppers? I don't know. There's, there's a, I've seen a YouTube video. Or zombie teeny boppers? There's a YouTube video out there that has like 10 movies, 10 movie scenes that were ruined by extras. Really? And it, and it, yeah, and it's That's well-known cool. movies that you never notice. There's some extra in the background doing something really stupid. Yeah. So I'm sure that none of those would be okay. Christian's extras. All right. And we do have a guest whom we will introduce after this theme song. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky at Christian's Gone, but we've got a guest who has come along. Who we forgot to tell this would be on video. Otherwise, he would have worn probably a three-piece suit with a flower in the buttonhole. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. How was Calgary? Calgary was fine. It was good. It was nice. There's very friendly people up there. I gotta, I gotta say, uh, thank you to to Gail Monsma, who's, mm. um, she leads the Association of Christian Schools International. Okay, I think is the okay. title. Anyway, they were great hosts. Uh, thank you, Gail. Thank it, you, Gail. It was. Um, thank you. And I met quite a few people who were fans of the show. Calgarians. They're from all over Canada. Oh, it was okay. like a nationwide okay. Christian cool. educator conference. Okay, and it was at it was at First Alliance Church. In was it the Alliance Church in yeah, Calgary? Big Alliance Church. Now Calgary is like rodeo country, mm -hmm. right? They're big. They're they're outdoorsy. Yeah, they're they're woodsy. Yeah, you land at the airport and you learn that real quick. Yeah, right. The decors. Yeah, yeah. It's funny how airports are now themed to the cities that you're landing at. Yeah. So you 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 they don't have they used to have the Blues Brothers like in Midway when you got they're still there. <laughs> they changed it out to something else. There, there's a there's they the, moved them somewhere else. If you go to the the A gates, yeah. And when you take that long corridor that way, there's a, a house of blues shop. There was. And they have the there two was. blue. I don't think it's there anymore. Really? Yeah, because they had only sold three t-shirts in 25 years, so well, I think they got rid of it. Anyway. But I recently flew to, to Louisville, Kentucky, and the whole airport is horses and bourbon. I've been there, yeah. Horses and bourbon, which, by the way, are not a good combination. They almost crashed in that airport. Did you? Yeah. Like crashed, like had to spend the night? No, like the plane almost crashed <laughs> <laughs> trying to land in that airport. Really? Yeah, we had to do a couple go-arounds. Too much bourbon? Was that the problem? It could have been. Pilots were having? It could have been. It was okay. very windy. Small plane. Okay, and you go to Phoenix and it's Southwest yeah. themed. Yes. M imagine airport. that. <laughs> this is like a revelation for you, huh, Phil? Well, I don't think airports used to theme them, to think so consciously about theming themselves to what is known about their location. You know what I found at the airport in Seoul? It's a self-consciousness that, that I think is new. What did you find at the little airport in your Seoul? No, in Seoul, Korea. Oh, it's a oh, very big I'm airport. In John? Yeah. Okay. That the, is a bit, very big airport. It's a big airport. They have robots going yeah. around the airport. Did you see the cleaning, picture? You, I saw the picture that it's you like, tweeted. It's like the... Little cleaning robots. It's like the, the king of all Roombas. Yeah. It was this... The king of the Roombas <laughs> who will lead the rebellion <laughs> against humanity. See, this robot is cleaning the floors. It's Roomba minions. But it has a... You know, it's tall. It has a big camera on the front and it yeah. talks to you. No. Yeah. In, in multiple, English? Multiple, multiple languages. languages. Yeah. So it's like C-3PO. Kind of. I'm fluent in 25 dialects. Yeah, but it was very kind of Korean because, you know, there's so... First of all, that country is immaculate. Yeah, very clean. Unbelievable. Clean. Like even the parking garages. Shiny floors really you could eat off of. Shiny parking them. garages. Yeah. Well, that's something. Is that their, maybe that's their theme. Clean? Yeah. We're clean? <laughs> well, if you saw what I tweeted about the toilet in my hotel room, it's certainly oh, true. I saw that it confused you. It was very confusing. Yeah. But... 
too many buttons. You know what? I like to try things in new countries. It's funny in America, we've just we're just starting to go from one button toilets to two button toilets if right. they have the adjustable flow. But in other parts of the world, they're like you know thirty button toilets. Right. They're like, have you ever seen the steering wheels of Formula One cars? Yeah. Yeah, they have like fifty buttons on the steering wheel. Right. And you know, if you're a NASCAR driver, it's just a big gear shift and a big round wheel, and then you go boom. But if you're a F- Formula One driver, you're like playing video games while you're driving, and the toilets are the same in Korea. It was, it was they're a like Formula, Formula One, One toilets. That's right. Well, did you win the race? Did you even make it to the finish line? I made it to the pit stop. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Our guest is uh, Reed Shushard. Shushard. Yep. Shushard. 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 Spell it. S C H U C H. Get closer to the microphone. S C H U C H A R D T. Okay, thank you. You need to buy a vowel, man. <laughs> yeah. Have German. you been to South Korea? Because you've been all over the place. I've been to Incheon, my favorite food in all of the international airports. Yeah. Really? Why would you get there? Huh? What'd you get there? I, I McDonald's. Got, uh, no, 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 I got, I got um, uh, some version of uh, rolls, wraps, and sushi. Uh, mm. I had kimchi french fries. What? They, had, uh, they took me to a, a Mexican-Korean fusion restaurant, mm. and they had kimchi french fries. Mexican-Korean fusion yeah. Yeah. in the airport? But I, and I pointed Seoul. out that french fries are neither Korean nor Mexican. There's a Seoul right. taco. Nor in French. Uh, They're vaguely mm. French. There's a French equivalent, but... Yeah, but it's not Korean or Mexican. I know. So it was Mexican, Korean, French fusion. Apparently, yeah. It was polyglot. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Reed Shushard is Associate Professor of Communications at Wheaton College. Um, he has an MA and PhD in Media Ecology at New York University. Is that when you grow media in like a little biosphere? Yeah. It's uh, saving the environment by getting rid of your television. <laughs> yeah. What is media ecology? Uh, media ecology came about in 1968, shortly after uh, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in 1962. The media studies and English professors of the world started to realize there was a need for a media ecology. The, coin, the term was coined by Marshall uh, McLuhan's son, Eric McLuhan. Oh, okay. Then put into a program at Marshall McLuhan's suggestion by Neil Postman okay. from 68 until his death in 2003. And you studied under Neil Postman? Yes, from 95 to 2005, wow. I studied at NYU, and, and uh, he died in 03. And I you studied there for 10 years? 10 years. How many degrees did you end up with? Uh, two from that school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Neil Postman is a cool guy. He wrote uh, Entertaining Ourselves to Amusing Death. Amusing Ourselves Ama- to Death. Amusing Ourselves to Death yeah. and the Disappearance of Childhood, which I've quoted from extensively in my speaking over the years. That's our product placement. Was, well. Yeah. Was he a nice guy? Was Neil Postman yeah. a nice guy? He was, he was fantastic. What did he, did he write another book after? He wrote about, uh, well, some say 20 books. I haven't been able to find 20, but he, um, probably his best book, I think, was um, uh, Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology. Oh. Probably his most comprehensive book. His favorite book in his own view was The Disappearance of Childhood. Yeah, I like um, that one. One but of the last books he wrote was called The End of Education. But he wrote that in like the, the mid-80s? Yeah, 85. And he never updated it? Because he had to have more thoughts 20 years later. Like, wow, things have gotten way worse. He did in a certain way. A lot of his books were updates of the previous okay. books. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what do you think is his best book? I think it's Technopoly. Oh, it's Technopoly. Of Technology. Yeah, okay. 90, 92. 92? And then... Um, it was somewhere in there that Neil, that uh, Roger Waters did the album based on Amusing Ourselves to Death. The album was called Amused to Death. Oh. And that spiked the admissions rate quite a bit. <laughs> really? Yeah. Roger Waters of Pink Floyd mm-hmm. did an album based on Neil Postman's scholarly work. He did. <laughs> or at least the title was inspired by it. It wasn't about the work. <clears throat> that makes you want to just think about that for a while. Have you heard that album, Sky? No. No, I haven't heard it either. I have not. The, uh, oh, okay. Um, so uh, I got some news. Let's hear it. Are you up for it? Before oh, wait, you didn't tell us how overall, how was South Korea? It was wonderful. Were you well received? I think so. Yeah. Was long, anyone... Long lines at the book signings. Was anyone confused by your ethnic yeah, origin? Yeah, we did. They actually did a Q&A with me because yeah. I spoke seven I think I did seven sermons, but in the middle. Wow. Different ones? Yeah. You didn't get to do the same one over and over no. again? No. Oh, okay. 
and they were all like over an hour because it had to be translated and it yeah. was it was it was exhausting in that regard but it was a lot of fun um, in the middle of it they wanted to do an hour long Q&A with me for the whole church where they wanted to know more about Sky the person because I don't Sky I don't person. preach a lot I'd about, like to my, know more about, about myself the person. you know no you don't I'm not kind of that kind you're of preacher you're not overly self revealing no so it got into my family history and my my wife and our why, why did we get married so young? Because it was like shocking when they found out I was married at 23. And when, um, did, when did they get married? In apparently, Korean? very late, increasingly okay. late. Oh. Um, and oh. then they they asked to see a picture of me with hair, so I had to show them that. Oh, and then that's scary. then they realized why I had to get married so young because you were losing your hair. Yeah, yeah. It was a race with time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did it make them like you more? Do you think? I hope so. The 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 Q and A part of the. I, well, they were laughing more. Okay, which is and good. did you sell books? Yeah, did you sell books? Yeah, and actually, the Durano Press, the publisher of my two of my books that were released when I was out there, I, I owe an enormous debt of gratitude because they did a rush job on translating the books, and and they yeah. looked. I should have brought them with me. I brought. I yeah. have some Korean copies. They're just amazing. They're really uh, great looking books. Wow. Well, okay. So yeah, we we and I'm. So was it like Black Friday? Did you make your year? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Are you I, now in the black? I, I don't for think the I year. make that much money off the books in Korea, oh. but it's great. It's it's helpful. Okay. Um, but okay. it, there there's talk of going back next year, okay. which should be fun. And mm-hmm. I feel like I have friends. I like genuine friends in yeah. at this wonderful church in Korea. Genuinely, it's a, it's what percentage? Church. What percentage of the church speaks English? I asked them that. They said, I think someone told me. Twenty-five percent can probably understand English pretty well, and ten percent can speak it fluently. Okay. Um, so not as high as I yeah. So a, had hoped. An interpreter is definitely necessary. Yeah, and and uh, Pastor Jay Chung is the guy who I hung out with most of the time, and he did all my translation, and he was. I mean, that's a really tough job to okay. kind of have. So we had two pulpits up there, and we're standing right next to each other. And I'm speaking, you know, say a sentence mm-hmm. or two, and then he has to listen to that and translate it on the fly. Does he? Imitate your hand gestures. Yeah, kind of, kind of. I mean, he has his own, but he's trying okay. to he's trying to get the same inflection and, and, uh-huh. and emphasis. That, and but it's a really difficult. It's difficult to preach that way. It's even yeah. more difficult to translate and be the conduit. Yeah, but right. uh, he's done it last year at this conference. Was John Piper came and did the same conference. Oh, okay. So he, if he can do John Piper with all of his crazy hand motions, uh-huh. I think he could handle me. Yeah. So you're more subdued. A little bit. You're, yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. But it was a wonderful, really okay. great experience. So you're glad you went? Very glad. Very cool. And I got to fly business class. I mean, that's just amazing. Yeah, because they, they... I'm spoiled now. Put you up for that? Yeah. That's pretty cool. It was a lie flat bed. How long is the flight? Uh, 14 hours. Okay. From L.A.? No. From like, the flight from Chicago to... to no, you were in Calgary. You I was in Calgary. Calgary? So I, I went from Calgary to Vancouver. Vancouver to Seoul was 11 hours. Okay. But then on the way back, I had to go through Toronto. That was oh. that was about 12 or 13 hours. Do you have hours. to go through Canada to get no, to South but Korea? It, because or, I was are we already, on bad terms I was, with South Korea? I was in Canada, so flying Air okay. Canada was the easiest way to do that. Oh. And it was a great airline too, by the okay. way. There's there's my plug for Air ding, Canada. Ding Air Canada. Ding Incheon Airport food service. Ding cleaning robots that are going to take over the world. Ding everything. Hi, Re- Hi Reed. Hi. Have you ever wanted to go to Mars? No. Really? <laughs> no. Never. But you've been to more than fifty countries. Yeah, but Mars isn't a country. Uh, no, I never wanted to go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have been known to, on the podcast, somewhat poo-poo the idea of, of space travel and all of us living on Mars. Or because on, there's so much demand that you felt the need to it just squash keeps, it. it. People won't let go of the idea that someday we're going to live in the stars. I know one person who won't let go of the people, idea. <laughs> I, I am on a mission... Not to Mars. It's one of my bubble bursting things where I think there's a there's a uh, reluctance to let go of some uh, modernist romantic idealism because we were all going to live in space someday. It was going to be like Star Trek and we were going to make friends with aliens and we were going to have a U.N. out in space and everything was going to be great and we would solve all of our problems. The only person I know who still talks that way is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh huh. Because everyone there's one. That's it, though. That's like it. Who else oh, talks that way? You don't way? think he has any fans? You don't think Neil deGrasse Tyson has any fans? He's like a little. He's a little. He is fine. He's a little Buddha to his own tribe. 
He's Gandhi to his own people. I, okay. Okay. Getting to, and this is a new article from Engadget, getting to and living on Mars will be hell on your body. Just have to lay this out there. So is going to Korea and coach. <laughs> Well, NASA, because both NASA and SpaceX are planning on sending people to Mars. It's, it's not like, oh, maybe someday, but it's like, here's our schedule mm. for sending people to Mars. Okay. This is how difficult it's going to be. While NASA and SpaceX figure out how to get to Mars, they're also thinking about how a 200-day journey and life on the red planet will affect humans. They'll be dealing with nasty things like muscle atrophy, bone loss, intracranial pressure, psychological issues, lack of resources, and long-term radiation exposure. So NASA and its partners are working on things like torpor. What? Torpor. A type of space hibernation, T-O-R-P-O-R. That's not an acronym. Have, no, it's not an ac- acronym. Have you ever heard of someone being put, for medical reasons, into a state of hypothermia? Yes. Like their brain is swelling. Something very bad has happened. Yes. So they lower their body temperature. Yeah. Okay. The belief is, is that if you could put people in a state of, of hypothermia, medical hypothermia, well, it reduces their consumption, it reduces a lot of things, and then you need less energy and, and stuff yeah, on a this, spaceship. Yeah, but this has been in sci-fi movies forever. I know, but they're trying to figure out how to do it. And it's not just here, you put you to sleep. It's like, okay, we actually have to figure out how to do this for real. The key is lowering your body temperature. Um, but not killing you. Okay. And then doing it, they think they could only do it in, in medical hypothermia, they can only do it for a couple of days, max. Mm-hmm. They want to be able to do it for about two weeks. So they would do it for two weeks, wake you up for a couple of days, put you back under for two weeks, wake you up for a couple of days to keep you alive. But they have to feed you while they're doing it, so you'd have to have a feeding tube put in your stomach. I have the perfect solution. Just subscribe uh, Netflix. Prescribe Netflix, and it'll do the torpor for you. <laughs> Which, until you're binge-watching all your way to Mars. It's or you're binge-watching until you fall into some sort of subhuman state, and then they can turn off Netflix and you coast to Mars. Netflix could probably give you the perfect astronauts today. Ooh, they're the already in a state of torpor. Today. Um, so you need a feeding tube in your stomach. They have to come up with some way, because in, in the movies, when you're put to sleep for like six months to go out in space, for some reason you don't need food and you produce no waste. You don't know that. I'm pretty sure, because they're sealed in there and there's nobody awake, except maybe one robot. Yeah, but there could be... There who's could, just checking to make sure what, your light is still blinking. Once you're asleep, you don't know what tubes are going in where. I don't. If they're doing surgery to put a feeding tube in your stomach, I think you'd notice. And if you wake up and you've got a feeding tube in your stomach and you're somehow wired for waste removal, I don't even want to think about that. Anyway, it's really hard to do, but they have to figure out how to do it because we have to live on Mars eventually or our modernist structure falls apart completely. Um, uh, they need drugs to make your body think that a lowered uh, temperature is normal. They need a tube inserted directly into your stomach to feed you. Then they would need to have some sort of whole body electrical stimulation to reduce mu- muscle atrophy, an oxygen hood for fine control of oxygen and CO2 levels, sensors to monitor your vitals, a temperature controlled environment, and yep, a waste collection Why can't, system. Why can't we just send robots? Why do we have to That's go? That's not romantic. If robots get to well, have all the fun. Well, this sounds really romantic. Why don't you just <laughs> light some candles? And Now, once you get there, this is one of the, uh, the researchers. The tyranny of Mars is that most of the water is located where it's not at all nice to live. So the water is at the poles, which are frozen. We have the same problem on this planet. Where it's warmer, there's no water. Um, on Mars, you're going to be living, not, not if you would maybe go to Mars, you would find yourself living. When you're on Mars, you are going to be living. This is a th- thing. This is a sure thing. This is our future, Sky. You and I are going to be on Mars eventually. That's what they're telling us. Okay. It's a matter of time until we're on Mars. You're going to be living right at the edge of technology, like the most advanced technology possible, but you're also going to be living a really primitive existence. Uh, she says, uh, I imagine going back to our cave dwelling days. If you're in a cave, you're protected from radiation and temperature swings. So you probably have to live in caves in Mars. So but, we're going to be like technological cavemen again. Yeah. 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 With feeding tubes and, okay. and wired for waste removal. 
It, so, in other words, you might. <laughs> this is the this is the journalist talking. In other words, you might be in kind of a hypothermic coma on the way to Mars, and then living in a cave, scratching out an existence once you arrive. Who in the hell would want to do that? <laughs> And the response from the researchers at NASA mm-hmm. was uh, to read the ad that Ernest Shackleton put out to find adventurers to come with him yeah. on his mission to the yeah. North Pole. When he said, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Yeah, that's, that's it. There's always been people that's like this. That's why we wanted to go to Mars. But that's true. The, like, the fact that they're quoting Shackleton shows that that's been true of human why is, exploration. Why do you think that's... Reed, why do you think that's true of humans? Why do we do stupid things for recognition and honor? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, oh, come on. The uh, the first guy that climbed Mount Everest. That was his yeah, answer. because it was yeah, there. Sir Edmund Hillary. Yeah, Edmund Hillary with Tenzing Norgay. Because yeah. it was there. Yeah. That's, See, there's always some of those. I don't think that's a really well thought out answer. I don't either. It's yeah. an emotional answer. I think they're, the people that want to do these things are, are need therapy? They love science, but they're working mostly from emotion. Yeah. Okay. Like the the Swedish reality show that wants to send people to Mars and make a reality show out of it to fund it, and they've had like two hundred thousand people apply for a one way ticket to Mars. I don't understand why this upsets you so much. Yeah. It isn't like Just, you're being drafted. Okay. Well, wait, wait. You said they're from Sweden. Yeah. So they're already in a sub. Yeah. Lower temperature. <laughs> they're, just, they're looking for a little bit of recognition for the okay. freeze. Okay, I got one more story. I got, right. one, I got one more story for you. Um, do you remember when Ross Perot said there would be a giant sucking sound from the South mm-hmm. if uh, NAFTA was passed? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was back in the 92 election. Yeah, the yeah. 90, yeah, way back. So Ross Perot, little guy, eh, talk like this. That's gonna be a I always got him confused with the Purdue chicken yeah, guy. Yeah, he was very much like the Purdue chicken guy. Yeah. They might have been the same person. And they both look like plucked chickens. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They were both... Sort of chickenish, mm-hmm. chicken esque. Is that correct? Chicken, chickenish, chicken styled, Ch- chicken fried. <laughs> There's a new giant sucking sound, and this is kind of interesting. It's changing the economy and disrupting our politics. Okay, what do you think? Is read? What do you think it is? The giant sucking sound. Cryptocurrency. Or... Cryptocurrency. Good answer. Like, like Bitcoin and that kind of stuff. Ethereum. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, giant sucking sound. Sky. Sky. I'm gonna say. Uh, people who spend money on virtual economies, like in video games okay. and stuff. Okay, okay, good. Two good answers, both completely wrong. Wow. Well. <laughs> uh, reversing the pervasive urban decline of 20th century's final decades, opportunity is once again flowing into the urban cores of the nation's largest metropolitan areas. In metro areas from Seattle to Chicago to Washington, D.C., new data shows that per capita incomes, education levels, and the young adult share of the population are rising rapidly in downtown urban areas that were left for dead 30 or 40 years ago. Simultaneously, in many of the same places, incomes, education levels, and the age structure is failing to keep pace or even deteriorating, starting to decline in the small town and exurban communities at the metropolitan area's periphery. This widening, now this is where it gets interesting, this widening geographic separation between town and country, reinforced by a strong urban tilt in such key measures as venture capital investment and new business formation, helps explain President Donald Trump's overwhelming support in the smaller, mostly white communities that largely feel excluded from the economic recovery since 2009. But the urban economic renaissance also helps explain the rising racial tensions in many cities as African-American and Hispanic communities worry about being not only left out, but also actively displaced by the new growth. It's regentrification. It's re, we are returning the upper class, mostly largely white, highly educated, and young are returning to the urban centers displacing the people that currently live there, but also taking economic life out of the surrounding areas. So here's the, here's the interesting part to me, yeah. is you have a baby boomer generation whose families, when they were kids, left the cities for yeah. the suburbs. Right. We abandoned them and let them just go to And heck. through redlining and other policies, kept minorities out of the suburbs. Yeah. Now those same baby boomers are retired, and many of them are selling their homes in the suburbs, they obviously have no kids at home anymore, and they are returning to urban centers yep. where they are regentrifying those communities and again pushing lower-income minority households out. Right. So 
the same generation is doing it at two ends of their age, you know, as kids and now as retirees. You know, we, we kicked you when we left and we're going to kick you That's when right. we come back. And there's, a, there's a, a large group of millennials who are delaying marriage very long and yep. staying in the cities because cities are not conducive for having young children. Right, and I, I actually wrote a I wrote a column about this a, f- a few weeks ago uh, when McDonald's announced that they were moving from Oak Brook, Illinois, where they've been forever, mm-hmm. to downtown Chicago. Mm-hmm. They bought Oprah Winfrey's old studio, and they're building their new headquarters on that site in Harpo the, Studios. Yeah, Harpo, in, on the West Loop of Chicago, which is just bizarre because they were in Oak Brook, which is wealthy, awesome schools, mm-hmm. great parks, great education, safe. Good shopping, mm-hmm. great huge mall right in the middle of it, and they had their own campus with and, their and own it's hotel. Right across section of major highways. In yeah, the easy area. to get to. Yeah. But McDonald's says we need uh, young millennials that are technologically literate and developers because right. everything is driven more by technology, and they want to live in cities. Yeah, all the so cool kids are downtown. We're moving downtown, abandoning the place that Ray Kroc built, mm-hmm. including Hamburger University, which is right there, mm-hmm. and moving downtown. And what is so? When are you moving? <laughs> I'm too old. I'm too old. I can't do it. Although a lot of empty nesters are also considering. That's what I was saying. Back going to, yeah. You know, Eric Brendy. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of this movement. Eric and, Brendy. Yeah, the author of Better Off: Flipping the Switch on Technology. Yeah. I think it was 2004 or five, and he pointed out that the ground zero of the inner city was the place to go now. Yeah. And the reason was it was the one place that urban sprawl couldn't reach. Oh. It's the it's it's immune to yeah. sprawl. It yeah. can't be sprawled. Yeah. Interesting. So in Chicago, the share of college graduates in the central city has increased increased since 1990 by 25 percentage points. Mm-hmm. Not 25%, 25 percent, 25 percentage points. Um, which is double the increase in if you go out 30 miles. So there are more college graduates in America now than there were, mm-hmm. but it's in increasing more than double in city centers than it is out on the peripheral. Um, in 1990, one in five people at the city center in Phoenix had a college degree. Today, it's three in five, which now is triple the level if you go out 30 miles mm-hmm. from there, where it used to be less than what it was 30 miles. Right. Out from there. Well, we I've I've been in um, I've been at some nonprofit ministries that are talking about the the shift of poverty from an urban center issue to a collar county collar county issue. Yeah, where poverty is being pushed out of the cities into the suburbs, and those suburbs are ill-equipped to deal with it. Wow. Interesting. So, yeah. Okay, get this. The Nonpartisan Economic Innovation Group, which studies economic trends, has calculated that before the 2008 recession, the number of new businesses created exceeded the number that failed in 80% of American metropolitan areas. Okay, so most metropolitan areas in the country made more businesses than failed. Okay. Uh, now, post-2008, 60% of metro areas are experiencing more business closings than openings. That's weird. And just five communities account for half of all net business creation. And those communities are New York, Los Angeles, Houston, Dallas, and Miami. So explain that. Why why are most new businesses failing in cities if cities are gaining much more educated, wealthy people? Five colossus communities account for half of all new business creation. This is largely a result of venture capital, which Mm -hmm. has clustered to specific areas. For example, more than half of all venture capital investment in clean energy technologies goes to just San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles, and Boston. So more money is being poured into fewer communities Mm. to start new businesses that actually work, not just, hey, my cousin opened a restaurant, or I have a shoe cleaning company. So along with unease about demographic and cultural changes, the sense of falling behind economically helps explain Trump's dominance of mid-sized and small-town America. He carried more than 2,600 counties last fall, more than any candidate in either party since Ronald Reagan. Conversely, the thriving economies and increasingly useful and youthful and well-educated profiles of the largest urban centers explain how Hillary Clinton carried 87 of the 100 largest counties by a combined margin of 14 million votes. But th- this is this is uh, leading to a looming political crisis. It's it's going to get worse because our constitutional system is set up to disproportionately 
represent rural areas yeah. rather than urban areas. Right. So the less population you have, actually, the more say you have in politics. Right. So, for Ironically. example, in the Senate, every state gets two senators. Whether you're a state like New York, which has, what, 20 million people, or you're a state like North Dakota, which has like four people. Yeah. And two of them are senators. But are your representatives? But, but that's but the Senate has a disproportionate yeah. Yeah. amount of power over the House of Representatives. So and, and even in the House of Representatives, an urban area, yeah, it's it, it's messed so, up. So small rural places are disproportionately represented. But as more and more Americans are living in cities, fewer of them are actually being represented proportionally. Right, and that's in gonna, our government. That's going to cause big problems. Well, that's why so many people are so adamantly against Trump. Partly because they can't believe how that could happen. Because, you know, me and all my friends right. didn't vote for him. Well, think about it. This is the third election since 2000, yeah. right? Yeah. Where where the the person who got the most votes didn't, didn't win, win the election. The third? I think it's the, isn't it the third? I don't remember. I don't. It's 2000. Sure. Yeah. Was there another one? This okay. One? Here's the, here's the. Maybe it's the second. The conclusion of this piece. And this was a, a CNN study. CNN piece. The frustrations of younger, mostly minority communities inside growing cities and the older, predominantly white communities at the periphery are really two reflections of the same challenge, finding ways to more widely disperse opportunity beyond well-educated workers in a few highly networked urban centers of clustered talent. Trump has responded mostly by pointing blame at foreign trading competitors, immigrants, and the political elite, while Democrats typically shake their fist at the rich and Wall Street. But both parties are still largely at square one for formulating an agenda that can plausibly channel more of the growth coursing through the biggest cities into the places it has bypassed, both nearby and far away. Well, and what it doesn't say is both of these parties are getting massive funding from those... From people that benefit from right. the way it's working. Right, because we have no yeah. limits now on, on political donations. Yeah. So. Did you read Hillbilly Eulogy? Have you read Hillbilly Eulogy? I've read Eul- summaries Eulogy? of it. Okay. Have you read Hillbilly Eulogy? No. Nope. Elegy. Hillbilly Eulogy? Elegy. Hillbilly Elegy? Not Eulogy. Eulogy? It's Ele- a eulogy. It's, you, but it's Elegy. You give a eulogy. Yeah, but it's Elegy is the title. It's elegant. It's an elegant eulogy. It was written about Butler County, Ohio, which yeah. is where I went to college. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So one of the points he makes in there that really struck me um, is the story of the, his hometown in, in Ohio and how when he was a kid, there was an upper class in that small town because there was a company, a successful company that was headquartered there, and that much of the civic life of that town were the people that worked at the top of that company Mm -hmm. and their wives, mostly men running the company, but their wives were doing all the social activism and making sure the parks were nice and taking care of raising money for schools and, you know, UNICEF and United Way and all all the stuff that you want in the rotary. And, And it occurred to me that that was like Muscatine, Iowa, when I grew up there. And my grandpa was one of the senior executives at Bandag Incorporated, which was a, you know, $300 million retreader of tires that was headquartered in Muscatine, Iowa. And my grandpa was also the vice mayor of the town, and my dad raised the money for the new library. You know, he was an executive at the company. It's just like a wonderful life. Yeah, so all of these executives, because there was an executive class in most small towns, because there were these little companies and factories all over the place. And that has largely been wiped out just because, you know, he talks about in Hillbilly Elegy, um, that company went out of business, or I forget, was bought by another company, and all the executives moved out of town. Right. They moved elsewhere. And, and it wasn't as much that, oh, there are no rich white guys here anymore. It was there's no one who are leading the civic efforts mm-hmm. anymore. No one with that civic pride who actually has the resources to do something about Mm-hmm. keeping this city a nice place. And, uh, you know, Bandag, my grandpa's company, was bought by Bridgestone. And they said, well, we, why do we want 300 workers sitting in Muscatine, Iowa? Right. Let's shut that down and we'll move them. You know, so when you see uh, Caterpillar just announced they're moving all of their management from Peoria, Illinois, to Chicago mm-hmm. because they want to live in a bigger city. Right. People want... Chicago does not need more civic-minded executives. Mm-hmm. It's got plenty. And, the, and the, the, if you're, you know, a middle upper manager at Caterpillar and you move to downtown Chicago, 
you're not really gonna make any difference. No one's even gonna notice you're there. You make a big difference in Peoria if you care about Peoria. Mm-hmm. So we're sucking well, don't you think the leadership part class. Of the, part of the reason, though, is these large companies have to draw yes, executives. Kids. Wait, the, the, they, have, they have to draw talent yeah. from a global pool of, of workers now. Yeah. And if you go to somebody who's living in South Korea, who's a brilliant engineer. Come and, to Peoria. And say, come to Peoria. You can buy a lot of house. Or come to Chicago. Yeah. They're going to be more inclined to say, I'll come to Chicago. Because right. it's a world-class city with a big airport and lots of theaters and right. you know and technology good and good food. And, and bars. And it's a lot harder to get somebody to, when you're competing with the what other engineering firm. What does it mean firm. for America? These are tough trends. All These are the, huge trends. The little towns and yes. medium-sized towns, are just like you need to have some well, industry. And then you add into that the heroin ec- epidemic. Oh, don't even start about the heroin. Which, which is, I mean, there's a lot of factors into that, but yeah. part of it is social, where there's so much depression right. In, right. in rural America that abusing these drugs becomes a short-term escape. Um, and there's a lot of policy and bad policy behind that, what's made this happen. But... Um, yeah, it's 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 horrible. It's, it's a little messed up. So it's good. Life is going to get better and better and better if you're in one of the right places to be. For yeah, and and worse and worse and worse if you're not. And that can only lead to. It's going to look like medieval Europe. It's going to, it just leads to civic unrest. Yeah. it's more people protesting inequality, and well, pointing fingers at each other. Or it's more people being strung out on drugs because they have no opportunities. There's that, and, too. And, and, and There's that too. Usually people who are strung out on heroin don't organize and protest. This isn't a very chipper conversation. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> hey, Reed, how hey, are you? Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how does... You, you gave a talk. I listened to a talk you gave at Wheaton called I Phone, Therefore I Am. Okay. Do you remember that? Yep. So... Uh, what kind of cell phone do you have? Uh, it's a no phone. It's uh, backwards <laughs> compatible. I you can do talk it. to whoever I want whenever I want. So you are a um, what, what? What would you say you are? I mean, you're a professor, I, but uh, your well, specialty. T- you know, to the perception of my students, I'm a luddite or an Amishman. <laughs> um, but in, in the media ecology tr- tradition. You know, we don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't a fish. So I'm, I'm a fish out of water because you have to be outside of the media ecosystem to perceive what it is. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have a cell phone. I don't have a internet connection at home. I don't have uh, a television. Huh. But you know, we have electricity. Yeah. I don't and ride a horse to work. Plumbing, indoor, yeah. outdoor. Yeah. Indoor how many outdoor. buttons are on your toilet? <laughs> just just one butt. Mm. Okay. And you have how many kids? Ten children. Ten children. Yeah. yeah. That, and, and how many of them have cell phones? Uh, two. The youngest? Know, three. <laughs> the, the youngest. Three, no, the, three yeah. old, the, the 23-year-old, 21-year-old, and 20-year-old. Okay. Okay. Which I suppose they are funding themselves. Oh, yeah. They're out of the house. So yeah, do yeah. you feel, uh, do, you, uh, do you go to the movies? Do mm-hmm. you we'll go to the movies? You don't watch Netflix? Nope. I assume. Well, without an internet you, connection or yeah, a television. Yeah, that would make it difficult, but if you, the hamster runs fast enough in the little wheel, sometimes mm. you can get a connection. Well, we, we, we have traded our, uh, our neighbor uh, organic tomatoes from our garden for his Wi-Fi signal, so my wife can check oh. her email. Because <laughs> she homeschools. So you're bartering. We barter. You're in a we barter do. economy. Yeah. Tomatoes for tomatoes Wi-Fi. For Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why? Why why are you interested so much in the media that you would go study with Neil Postman for 10 years? And then why are you repelled so much by the media that you would evict it from your, your little house on the prairie existence? Um, media ecology is interested in human flourishing. And the real question is, you know, what, what makes for a good equation for that? And the answer that most histories and most cultures have given is, well, the closer to nature you live, the closer to God's original environment, yeah. you know, the more uh, happy and healthy you're going to be. So uh, we look at everything from uh, physical health to mental health as uh, in relationship to your environmental inputs. And uh, if you take an example like uh, attention deficit disorder, we're not convinced that it's a actual frontal lobe disorder. We think it's a misdiagnosis. We think it's more of a natural result of an information overload. Okay. So, uh, 
as one doctor put it in the New York Times recently, he said, we've decided as a culture that we can't modify the kid, so we, uh, so we can't modify the kid's environment, so we decided to modify the kid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so <clears throat> we're just trying to raise um, kind of counter-cultural kids, but counter-cultural these days just means counter-media, because media is what we do 12 to 15 hours a day. So the only thing you really have to do to be yeah. countercultural, yeah. or that you can do to be countercultural, other than like not wearing clothes, is just turning off the TV. Right. I mean, it's it's uh, to the Catholics, it's probably called the Benedict Option. Um, okay. Uh, you know, we, we we do imitate the Amish in certain ways. Um, yeah. Mary Young have a big family, um, which again, in a floating currency who symbol would, system. That's who would a, you say way, is we in this scenario, other than you and your wife? Is, oh, is uh, this a is this a movement? Like like minded crazies like is ourselves. Is this a movement? <laughs> and if so, what is it called? Um, yeah, it's not. It's a it's a loose, disparate network. Is it, is of, it like know. a back to the earth movement? Is no. it a Mother Jones thing? Is People it have been a, trying to name it. I mean, Rod Dreher in two thousand five called it Crunchy Cons. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're somewhat apolitical. We 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 okay. lived in the city in the country. We you know been raised internationally you know how do you know what donald trump just tweeted if you don't have an internet connection oh, that's where i envy you uh well because when i get to work i immediately find out you oh. know, everything people and, tell yeah, you yeah. or because you then plug in and download a whole well i i, I predicted trump's election in august of 2016 so Did you? three months before i what, what made you think were you that? reading your chickens no, it was the media analysis of his use of Twitter versus Hillary's purchasing of TV ad campaign. Oh. I realized uh, she's running a straight neocon TV political campaign from the 90s, whereas he's, right. he's playing two-man political survivor using Twitter. And uh, well, she spent $111 million on yeah. advertising, and he spent $10 million. It, yeah. You, know, you so. need to be clear. He's clearly... Reed is clearly not anti-media because he's in it all the time, but he has really strong boundaries around it. I think he it. is anti-media. Well, I mean, he's studying it. He's no, I'm not anti-media. It's it's ecological. Uh, yeah. Here's a here's a good example. Uh, uh, in fact, this is perhaps my best example uh, in terms of the practicality of it. Yeah. Uh, let's say you're anxious about your kids texting and driving. Yes. You're not going to be... Um, so harsh and cruel as to not get them a cell phone or take it away from them when they drive. Oh, heavens no. Right? So what can you do? Well, you can drum it into their heads and drill them and yell at them and whatever. But the, the truth is, it's a constant temptation. It's a constant risk. Right. Yeah. So buy them a stick shift car. Problem solved. <laughs> right? You, you displace the problem so that they have to have two hands to operate the car. And okay. then texting and driving goes down hugely. Okay. So all of our kids have to learn how to drive stick shift. Really? You've, yeah. you've done that? Yeah. It's a, it's a thing. And then and when they get to college, this is like a really cool thing. Like, yeah. you know how many college kids, right. guys or girls, know how to drive stick shift? Very few. Right, right. How do they do when they, when they leave home and have to make all their own decisions and have friends? That uh, are... There's usually a curve. They, they, they jump into the deep end uh, and, and get all the toys and gadgets they never had. Okay. And then they come back to the surface and they go, oh, now I see why you did mm -hmm. that. Okay. We, yeah. we were just at a benefit dinner last night for Young Life. You know Young Life. Yeah, right? Young Life. Yeah. Right area Young Life. And uh, my daughter, both my son and daughter are involved in it, but they played a bunch of videos of students kind of sharing their testimonies of their involvement in Young Life. And one of the consistent things that came up over and over and over again is when these kids go away for a week in the summer to a Young Life camp, they take away all their phones. And over and over and over again, the students are saying how grateful they were to not have their phones for a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they can actually be present with one another and they can reflect and they can think and they, they don't feel the constant pressure of all the garbage on social media and keeping up. Yeah. And it just gives them space. And you realize, like, we had that when we were kids because we didn't have cell phones. Yeah. Like you could come yeah. home from school and decompress. Yeah. And now they right. don't get that chance at all. Yeah. Right. Wheaton College's Honey Rock program, their freshman yeah. orientation. Mm -hmm the whole week or 12 days, whatever you get, you get your cell phone taken away. And there's a study that came out a year or two ago that said it takes five days for you to not have your cell phone before you start to actually make eye contact and get the oxytocin uh, release that eye contact gives you, mm -hmm. and suddenly you feel happier. And so uh, the recommendation was never have a camp program that's shorter than five days because they're not going to get that benefit otherwise. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, first three days, wow. it's going to be annoyed and irritated, and I could be on Twitter or yeah. you know, YouTube. Right. right. I, yeah. I remember when I picked up my daughter and some of her friends from camp this summer, uh, the, the, the camp leader had, had his backpack, and he opened up his backpack because their phones were all in it. They had yeah. to leave a few hours early. So, and, and they all looked in that backpack and looked at each other like, 
do we really want this? <laughs> like, do we want these back? Yeah. Because we've had such a good experience. Mm. Yeah. And sure enough, within 24 hours, my daughter was saying, like, you know, back on social media and things are going on. And, yeah. and she's saying, I, I don't want this. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was, do you all know Nancy Jo Sale's book, uh, American Girls? It came out a year or so ago. No. Mm-hmm. It's uh, social media in the lives of American teenagers, especially girls. I think girls. I heard her interviewed on yeah. NPR. Well, she has a great comment or moment in there where she's talking very frankly to these group of teenage girls and they say social media is ruining and destroying our lives. Mm-hmm. And she says, well, why don't you get off? And they say, well, because then we'd have no life. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I just pulled this article. I don't know if you've seen it. Smartphones are smart. Have smartphones destroyed a generation by Jean Twain? Twinge. Yeah. Twinge? Yeah. yeah. She just, she did the narcissism epidemic and now this, her next book, iGen, this is an excerpt yeah, from that. Right. And, yeah. and one of the things she cites in this article, this is on the Atlantic website, if anyone's interested, um, suicide rates among teenagers have skyrocketed since 2007, yeah. Yeah. which is when smartphones came out. Yeah. Um, and like the trend had been down for 50 or 30 years, suicide rates, and now all of a sudden, like teenage girls, it's up 200%, yeah. Yeah. which is shocking. Mm. I mean, are, are, are these conversations that are happening in your world about? We're having them in the classroom, um, and uh, I mention them in, in various lectures I give. But uh, in and well, I think Time Magazine just did a story. You know, it's time to talk about our kids and cell phones. Yeah, but like if this were happening because they put some new additive in milk, mm-hmm. oh yeah, mm-hmm. people you know, would be freaking out. Yeah, but yeah. why aren't they recognizing that this is correlated well, with I mean, media use? A lot of people yeah. die because of cars. Yeah, but, but they don't. That the death rate sure hasn't gone not. up two hundred percent in ten years. If 200% death rate went up in cars over 10 years, there'd be investigations. Yeah. Well, maybe they did. Well, again, again that, that's, that's a great point. We, we talk about this all the time. Uh, look at 2016 was the highest year since 2007 in um, uh, automotive fatalities. Right. In America. It was 40,000. Because of and, cell phones. No, no, 40,000 just automotive tragic you know, crashes that led to death. Right. They estimate 23% in a different study, 23% of... Um, Crashes are texting related or, or distracted driving. Twenty three percent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that means ninety two hundred people out of these yeah. forty thousand. So texting now, killed ten thousand people well, last year. Th- that, that's just it. If Steve Jobs in two thousand and seven had introduced the iPhone and said, "There's just this one drawback. It's going to kill ten thousand of you a year," right? Yeah. People would have thought he's a lunatic. Yeah. You know, and an insane, and like they would have put him away. Um, but now that this is becoming more and more quantifiable, and the. Um, the DMV and uh, federal agencies that are investigating this stuff, they've now quantified it very, very specifically. They don't call it, it used to be funny and cute to be like uh, driving while intoxicated. Now it's, there's visual distraction. Uh, it's, it's just called distracted driving. There's three types, visual distraction, manual distraction, or cognitive distraction. Hmm. And visual distraction is eyes not on the road. Mm-hmm. Manual distraction is hand not on the wheel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mental distraction or cognitive distraction is mind not on driving. Well, of course, a cell phone is all three of those. Right. Mm -hmm. So Mm. they're quantifying the cause of the crash now to that level of like specificity. And in every case, the cell phone comes out as like an accomplice to the crime. And this is what's driving, no pun intended, a lot of the push toward autonomous cars. Well, that's just it. The solution isn't to get rid of the phone. It's to make a driverless car. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. In fact, fact, NPR. That's way easier. What did you hear? Wait, wait, don't tell me this past weekend. No. No. They're talking about this new... Thing, uh, Toyota's coming out with a new uh, driverless car for 2020, I think, where the car will talk to you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and, and say what? Well, that's just it. They were joking about Put how... Put down your phone, yeah, hell. You'll have to, you'll have to you know, make nice with it. Otherwise, it'll reject you, and you'll have to you know, get a different car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my bad. Oh, speaking of which, your car is calling. <sighs> Hi, Sky. So what, you're, you're not just a parent that doesn't like technology. You're, you're a scholar. In, in these areas. So what do you, what does media do to us? What do our cell phones do to us? And how does that affect us you know, spirit, as whole people, spiritually, yeah, yeah. relating to God? What do, you, what do you like to talk about and study? Well, it, it interrupts or mediates our relationship to our primary environment. You know, if you think about what, what does God do at the beginning, he puts his perfect organism in the perfect environment, right? It's a man and a woman in a garden. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, in, in the 20th century, uh, Legman and others defined mental disorder as the normal reaction, the defensive reaction of normal individuals against abnormalized environments. So a classic example would be PTSD, mm-hmm. right? A soldier comes back from the war and he's crossing the street and he hears a car backfire and he hits the deck. 
he's not disordered. He's reacting to a trigger, a signal yeah. in his environment that says to stay alive by dropping down as soon as you hear what you think is gunfire. Now, it's St. Charles, Illinois, and he's embarrassed because he looks up and he's like, this isn't the war. This is just mm-hmm. suburbia. Mm-hmm. Um, but that type of event and that type of reaction in a multimedia environment is now happening all the time, which is why the most digital age is also the age of stress, the age of anxiety, the age of sleep disorder, the age of uh, incru- increased suicide ideation as well as attempts as well as completions. Mm. Um, that just getting through the day uh, without being triggered in a thousand different ways is is more and more difficult, especially for the young who haven't been um, trained in a before or after scenario. That's a really interesting observation that it's not us that's that are broken, it's our environment that's screwed up, but our response is to try to change ourselves rather than change our environment. Yeah. Which is really messed up. Yeah. Well, again... Well, it's easier to take a pill yeah. than to change the way you live. Yeah, but it seems so backwards, doesn't yeah. it? Probably, yeah. yeah. So when did you start changing the way you live, or have you always lived the way you live? Well, I think it was the other way around. I think I was drawn to media ecology because I knew from an early age I wasn't like the rest of the people in my culture. So okay. I, was, I, was, I was born in Vermont, but I was raised in the Caribbean in, in St. Martin. My parents uh, were in tourism. And when I came to the States, um, I was really unmediated there. No, no, no television, no newspaper, no telephone hmm. uh, in our house. What did you do as a kid? How did you spend just, your time? Literally, we went swimming every day. We went running. We skateboarded. We did, you know, just physical. But you activity. are in St. Martin, so that's not fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. We could swim. I was in Iowa, right? Um, but so when I came to the states, suddenly you couldn't have a conversation in the schoolyard. You couldn't have friends unless you had seen what was on TV the night before. Yeah, right. And you couldn't be in the in-group unless you had certain symbols on your shirt. And mm. as a nine-year-old, I was bewildered and fascinated by this. So that's mm. what drew me to like, what is this thing that's so you, kind of you've programming people? So you've always felt like an outsider visiting yeah. a foreign yeah. planet exactly. and then writing yeah. about it. Yeah, and which again, I was raised uh, pagan. So mm. this was also one of the key metaphors that drew me to the faith was, the outsider, the idea of your uh, a resident alien, that you have a temporary visa, that you're yeah. not from here and you're not, you know, this isn't your permanent home. Okay, unpack that. How did you, how did you find God coming, at what point in your life, and how did this dynamic influence that? Um, well, sort of my intellectual maturation in college coincided with my awareness of the need to study media in graduate school. And... I saw, wow, well, in both cases, uh, it's the outsider that actually has a sort of perspective that the insider doesn't have. Mm-hmm. So um, Neil Postman called it a perceptual advantage. Not that you're any smarter, mm-hmm. but just that right. because you're not watching five hours of TV a day, right. you haven't been told what to desire, what to want, what to feel, and how to sort of right. have these knee-jerk programmed cultural responses. So... Uh, being raised with a normalization of the loss of social capital for being on the outside, mm-hmm. it was no, it was no, it was not much of a bigger price to pay to become a Christian. It was just as uncool, mm-hmm. right, to do that as it was to not have an eyes out on my shirt. Um, so it's like, okay, you know, um, uh, if it's true, I'll, 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 I'll pay the price. Okay. Um, and then you know, from there, you're like. So well, how old so were you when you when you came to Christ? Uh, I was about 22. Okay. And, and you, uh, were, you, were you at NI, NU? No, I was NYU? at Swarthmore College okay. uh, in Pennsylvania. And, um, uh, you know, Tyler Wake Stevenson, author of Brain yeah, yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, uh-huh. we went to the same school. Okay. Um, or the guys that started uh, uh, spot, uh, auto-tune the news, those guys. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they all, they, huh. all disorder. they were a couple of years younger than me, uh-huh. so I never knew them there. But um, uh, my wife and I married in college. I was 24. She was 21. Mm-hmm. Started having kids, never stopped. <laughs> well, that's a little easier when you don't have a TV. Yeah. And, and was she a, a that's the, Actually, that's the fun answer to get when people was say, don't she, you have a TV? Go, nope. Yeah, that's... Was she a believer at she was. the she time? Was, she was a cradle Christian. She was... Okay. Her parents were missionaries, and she was raised... Also born in the States, but oh. raised in um, Malaysia and Singapore. And Did she have a similar Philippines. media mm-hmm. experience in mm-hmm. childhood? Mm-hmm. Yep. So you were both looking at this culture is saying this is nuts we don't think we want this for yeah the only non-negotiables i had when we got married was you can't smoke and you we can't ever have a tv and she said okay 
<laughs> I said, you're my girl. That's that's pretty easy premarital counseling. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, you know, I wish we had gotten uh, advice on other things, but yeah, <laughs> in, in terms of that, it was, it was useful. Okay, so your kids grew up similarly then where were you when you started raising kids and and how did you try to give them the childhood that you had when you were in St. Martin yeah well we try to travel as much as we can with our children okay we live very simply so in in Jersey City where we were for 10 years for grad school we lived in a 650 square foot apartment but you didn't have 10 kids at that point no we had two kids when we started and six kids when we left so we were you illegal- had six kids in a six hundred and fifty square foot apartment. Yeah, so the eight of us were illegally occupying it, but we had a nice landlord that looked the other way. Okay. And um, then we lived in Switzerland and had a small apartment there with six kids. Where in Switzerland? In Lugano. I was a professor. What do Franklin six College. kids do in a small apartment when they have no media? They, uh, sing. they play soccer. They go outside. They play soccer. Okay. I build models in the basement or the garage. Your apartment had a basement. Had a, a garage that we didn't have a car for, so okay. we, we used it to build model airplanes. And, <laughs> yeah, huh. um, and here, here, you know, the average square footage of the American home is twenty three hundred square feet. Yeah, the average number of kids is one point three. Yeah, so we have ten kids in a fourteen hundred square foot house. So we 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 give our kids experience over uh, amenities. I feel like I need to visit you in your native environment. You think you uh, need to yeah, make a fun. documentary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel yeah. like we may have to come to your house. Yeah. We're just down the I, I ran into you and your family at Chick-fil-A once. I don't think it was your whole family. Yeah, were we all dressed like cows? No. <laughs> okay, because we usually go there only when it's free. <laughs> and you dress like a cow? You know, they have these days during the year. If you dress like a cow, you get a free sandwich. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's where we go. <laughs> Okay. How do you know about these days if you yeah. don't, don't? My get... students tell me because <laughs> they have an app that reminds them. He has a network. Oh yeah. man, yeah, it's a human network, however, not a digital one. So what? Okay, so if you're a parent like me, you're kind of feeling a little depressed, like you did it completely wrong, and there's no way to. How do you make little changes that can add up to something meaningful? Uh, the first thing I say is make a rule: no cell phones at the dinner table. Or yeah, the breakfast yeah. table or the lunch table. Make that rule, enforce that rule, and then good things will flow from there. Okay. People after dinner might be like, hey, well, let's read a story together. Let's sit around the fire and play a game. In other words, people actually enjoy being with each right. other once they realize they're not going to be ignored for the cell phone. We have that policy at our dinner table. Yeah, yeah. So what, what concerns you about what you see right now with, with students coming through your classes? Uh, the loss of literacy. The, 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 what's what, what you know? What's called a literacy? I can read, but I choose not to. Mm-hmm. So, did you buy the book? No, the book that was assigned, the book on the syllabus. Yeah, well, no. Can't w- you? What'd you do instead? I read reviews. I listened to the audio book, chapter one, free giveaway file. You know, like I did everything but. Um, well, can't you, know. you grade down for that? Oh yeah, you can to to a certain degree. <laughs> but you, I mean, the question is. If you don't want to achieve literacy, why are you in college? Right. And their answer is, well, it's the 21st century. I'm not interested in a 19th century medium. And to which you say, oh, that's true. <laughs> you know. Hmm. So in a sense, it's the college that's behind the curve, not the students. All right. This, this is a conversation for another podcast. But I'd love to pick your brain about what this all means for the church. Oh, yeah. For, it means everything. Yeah. Oh, what, come on. What, what, we can't just leave that hanging Well, because here's I, I, told, I showed you that little graph yeah. I tweeted out earlier today. But, uh, so I have this hypothesis. I mean, we're just, we just celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And tomorrow. Yeah, it's this, well, this podcast comes out tomorrow. Oh, okay, yeah. Right, so yeah. you get it. Uh, a lot of people will say that one of the things that facilitated the Reformation was the printing press. It right? was the Reformation. Right. The, the scriptures become more accessible to people. There's more interest in the scriptures, but there is low ability to engage because there's literacy rates are fairly low early mm-hmm. on anyway mm-hmm. in the Reformation. So you find the guy who can read and who's educated, you give him a Bible and you say, we'll show up once a week, please teach us the scriptures. And preaching becomes the centerpiece of Protestant worship going yep. forward. It shifts from the Eucharist yep. to the, the scriptures. We've basically been in that model for 500 years. Correct. We go to church, yeah, we sing some songs, but we're primarily there to hear some guy talk and hopefully teach something accurate from the Bible. We are in the midst of another... And if we don't like it, we can start our own denomination. Right. That's the other side of the Reformation is we all have the freedom to, to, to yeah, screw the authorities. This. I can interpret this. Right. Uh, we're in another technological revolution with digital yeah. technology. And now we have... In the past, there was this high demand for scripture engagement, low supply, so people engage by gathering together and hear some guy teach it. Now we have this massive supply of Bible teaching 
anyone through a digital device can get a bazillion things, good or bad, yep. Bible teaching wise, but there's diminished demand. Value is always a function of scarcity. Yeah, so supply and demand is completely reversed from yeah. the where it used to be. And then you go to most Protestant churches and the centerpiece is still preaching, it's still teaching. It's The assumption is you need to show up here on Sunday to hear some guy talk about the Bible. Mm-hmm. And I talk to millennials all the time who are committed to their faith who just go, I don't understand why I'm going to church or why I should go to church. When I, I wouldn't say that's the centerpiece of, of uh, church anymore. I'd say the centerpiece of church is now the cult of personality of the pastor. Right, but it's still the idea of some guy standing up there. The, the, it's presumed to be to teach something to me right, when I can right. get that a million other ways online right now. Right. So the basic economy of why people go to church or have gone to church for five centuries has yeah. changed. Yeah. Most pastors I talk to about this don't want to change that model, but they're angry or upset or frustrated that a generation is now around that doesn't show up on Sunday. Yeah, I've had I've had this conversation with various pastors. One of the things I say is, uh, look, if value really is a function of scarcity, why are you giving away your weekly sermons for free on the internet, which is just an invitation to not come? Right, but why not just say it's live, it's here, it's one day of the week only. You've got to be there to get it. Well, it's the same reason your students won't read a book. And you think need to trade a tomato for the sermon. <laughs> right, right. Some of yeah. them might throw it. Bring a tomato. Um, no, but in other words, if you'll, if you'll camp out all night to get those tickets to get mm-hmm. to see that concert of that one singer in concert yeah. live, mm-hmm. right? But don't, don't you think it's because most pastors know they're not that good? Uh, no, I think it's because they are, I think they're sincerely trying to help uh, further and spread their message, mm-hmm. also reach their elderly and shut-ins, right? Mm-hmm. They're you know, out of Christian love and concern. Right. But they don't realize that it's also simultaneously undercutting right. the overall, why would I go there? Yeah, but when I talk to a young person, they might admire their pastor or think they're great, whatever, but they also realize, well, I'm going to listen to these other five celebrity pastors because they're so entertaining. Right. And the average pastor, as faithful and, and good and, and, and doctrinally sound as they may be, are not as entertaining. Right. Well, so they're competing in this media environment yeah, yeah. in which they can't really compete. Yeah, but as soon as you say entertainment, that's not the focus on scripture. That's I the agree. focus on television. I agree. Right? I mean, it's so. it's all warped, but the... the are we doomed? Read, shoot, like, shard? I'm, my question is, what do we do? Because there's two factors there. One is, okay, don't give away your highest value stuff for free by just tossing it out on a podcast or YouTube or whatever. But the other side is, do we need to rethink what we're doing on Sunday morning just like they did 500 years ago because the supply and demand issue is different. And maybe there are other things we can be doing on Sunday morning that can't be outsourced Yeah, the way teaching now can be. Yeah, well, the short answer is yes. We have to rethink all of it now. Yeah. But um, the good and bad news is that the digital media world brings us back to orality, brings us back to the spoken as the primary thing, not the, the visual or the literate. Right. So, okay. Mm. Oratory. Wow. We're going to need more ukuleles. Are you discouraged? Not at all. Are you you're, kidding? You're not discouraged. You, you can't accuse a man with 10 kids of pessimism. <laughs> <laughs> I have That's a wild true. and optimistic hope for the future, <laughs> personally. Okay, and do you think, do you see your kids as your statement of a, a better way to live? Well, that would be my hope, but you know, who was it said, uh, "Call no man happy till he's dead." Uh, I, I don't, I don't know how it's going to go. Okay. You know, we're still working right. on it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Reed. Hmm. Thank you. Now I've summed that up with a song. Oh, we're with Reed Shushard. I think it sounds pretty hard to live without media constantly feeding ya. But our friend Shushard says it's not too hard. Just start by putting your cell phone away and go and build a plane or fly a kite or just play. You can make it better by starting out today. Just have 10 kids and no TV and you can live quite happily. And we'll go to Reed's house and then we'll see if he's lying. Or if it's true. All right. Thanks for being on the show, Reed. Thanks. That was awesome. Do you have any uh, news? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real quick. My website was down and out for like, you know, for months. It was a pain. It's fixed. Okay. It is fixed, fixed. But here's the thing. I know there were people who were trying to reach me to get me to come out and speak. But because the website was screwed up, they couldn't probably get a hold of me. Please try again. 
Like, I want to come out and speak. You don't have to give me kimchi french fries or really cool heated electronic bidet toilets. But you could. But you could. Um, or business class travel even. But yeah, check out my website again because if you hadn't reached me now, you can. Thank okay. you. And we are about to put up the second unit in our family devotional series. Uh, the second one is about Ephesians. The first one was First John. The second one is Ephesians. And it should be up in the next couple of days, maybe as soon as when you're listening to this. So go to faithblocks.com faithblocksblox.com and you, there's two series that you can go through with your kids and uh, hopefully Christian will be back here next week I don't know what we have set up for next week but something I don't know, I don't know either mm-hmm. I don't know either thanks once again to read if people want to learn more about the kind of stuff you do obviously you don't maintain a website no I do several uh, yeah. second nature journal second nature go. journal dot com yep. okay but you can only see it at work <laughs> <laughs> um, they should log in uh on Tuesday the 31st because we're going to have a big piece about the printing press and the Reformation. Oh, oh. Second Nature Journal. 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 Dot com. Yep. Check it out. Hmm. Thanks, guys. See you next time. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com.